It's not a blind. We didn't pay. We did not pay our bills. I just I had to turn off the lights for a second. My son. So we're going to talk about something that Carol should be familiar with, this, uh, part of scripture, and that is being a light, all right? And I couldn't get it any darker than this, but I just wanted to give a visual, because what does light do? It penetrates the darkness, right? And that's what we are to do, and we're going to be light. But Luke, you can turn it back on. He's only here for a few minutes. I just wanted to give a visual. But... But earlier pastor was Ooh, earlier pastor was preaching this morning and he got a little as I had to go upstairs with Carol when I came down, he was reading Matthew five, eleven and five twelve. I was like, Oh, he's about to read I didn't know he was stopping at twelve. I was like, Oh no, he's about to read all my verses. He's about to preach the same thing. I'm about to figure out something else to preach from. But then he stopped at twelve, so I'm grateful for that. But but if you go to Matthew 5, verse 13, and I'm reading NIV, just so you know, so it's a little different. And it starts at 13, it says, you are the salt of the earth, but, in, but if the salt loses its saltness, in the King James it says flavor, flavorness, how can it be made salty again? It is not it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now, Drew Lucas did not come down because I told him they didn't have to. Because Lucas, he, I asked him what he talked about in Sunday school, and he said, well, it was 30. He said it's kind of funny because when we were down in Maryland, we went to a, a church, and my <coughs> sister-in-law actually taught him, and they talked about being the salt. Then a couple weeks ago, I had to take Nancy's class, so Lucas and Drew were the only two here that day. And guess what I talked about? The salt in the light of the world. And then today, in Miss Carol's class upstairs, they talked about being salt and light again. So I told him if he wanted to go upstairs so he didn't have to hear it for a fourth time, he could. So, And Drew, the same way, he talked about it. I talked to him twice about it. But I know a lot of times these verses, they're very well known. We've talked about them a lot of times, and I actually also talked about this in the board meeting for devotional, but I think but the reason I brought it up is because sometimes I think it's a good reminder just to get back to the basics. You know, the basic is usually these are lessons that we teach at Sunday school a lot and children's church, but I think sometimes we forget as adults that we are the salt and the light. You know, we do all these fun activities with the kids, and actually in my mind, I, I knew I couldn't get it as dark as I wanted, but I kind of pictured it'd been cool if everyone had a light and you know, and this, everyone was shining their own light. But I knew it wasn't gonna get that dark. But yeah. <laughs> but in 13, again, it says, "You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled." So. One thing you got to know, I when I was doing my, in my actually down and below, was talking about the salt back then, in that day, most of it came from the Dead Sea. And one problem with the Dead Sea is the salt that came out of it had improperties. It wasn't always pure. So that's why in this day and age back then, a lot of times the salt would lose its flavor because it was not a pure salt at the time. So, but what do we use salt for? flavor, right? There's two things for salt. One is to what? Flavor and the other is preserve, right? Now, real quick, I'm going to give you all a chance to speak. Name something that you like that you can't eat without salt. There has to be something. I know everyone has something. Chicken, okay? What? Popcorn. That's what I was thinking of. Popcorn, right? 
right? Anyone else? What else? Eggs, okay. Right? And why is it? How about how about something small? Chocolate chip cookies. Because you only put a teaspoon. Who's ever had a chocolate chip, chip cookie after and you forgot to put the salt in? You can taste the difference. I know I used to make cookies all the time, all the time when I was younger. And and I remember a couple times I'd forget the salt. And even that it was just a teaspoon of salt in the big bowl, it made a big difference when it came out and I taste it, like, this doesn't taste right. And then I had to think back, like, oh, I forgot the salt. But when you forget the salt, it loses flavor. The whatever you're adding, it adds flavor. So for us, what does that mean? Well, we're supposed to be flavorful, right? We're supposed to be attractive in the sense of people should be attractive to our spirit, attractive to our character. We shouldn't be some bitter, nasty thing that when people is around us, they don't want to be around us. There, there's some, we should bring something different to the table than the rest of the world. But as it says here, but if the flavorness, if you lose this, if salt, wh whether it gets out and it gets wet, it can lose its properties, so then it's no longer flavorful. And the problem is with salt, once you do that, you can't get it back. So just like us, once we get to a point where we are like nasty and cruel to people and we're and then we're in church, we're gossiping, we're gossipers, we kind of lose our flavor. People don't want to be around us. We're kind of no longer are we uh, draw to people, but now we're turning people away from us. Or we're turning people away from the word, especially if we claim to be a Christian and we're nasty and crude. It's going to turn people off. Well, the other thing we talked about that Saul did too, especially back then, is it was preserved, right? But even back in the America, back in the day, what they used to do is they went and killed something. They would put salt on it and then hang it in the, you know, hang it, and that's what kept it fresh. It preserved. Well, another thing that we are to do as well is we are preservers of God's word. We are the ones who should be spreading God's word. We're the ones that need to tell the world about the love of Christ and and then upstairs they sing a word and in VBS they sing the song ancient of of ancient words because that's what yeah that's cool and that's the thing these words are ancient but they need to be preserved and it's our job to do that now I will say I'm not as good as I should be but I, I know, uh, but for example, how many know that back in the day, the young Jewish boys, they, were, they had to memorize the first five books of the Bible by heart. They had to get up and actually quote it, get up and read the entire thing. Now, I don't know how many of us would be able to do the entire Bible word for word all the way through, like some of the old Jewish priests and that, but, but we do need to start reading this more and more and starting to do it in the memory because... There could be a time, like in China, where they come and take this word away. And we don't have the written part. We don't have our phones because, though, because as we can see, Google and all these uh, sites, they can block whatever they want. So they could easily start blocking. Right now I can go up, and it's pretty, you know, it's, it's very valuable to me because I can go up and I can put up a scripture and I can get, like, some different people's opinions on what they think. Of, and I try to look at, you know, like Franklin Graham and different sites. But the thing is, I believe there's going to come a day soon where I'm not going to be able to do that anymore because they're not going to want these sites up. They don't want easy access to the Word. They're going to take it away. So how are we going to preserve this then? It has to be here and here. So we have to put it in our heart and read it and memorize it because, again, I'm not saying you're going to have to memorize it word for word all the way through. But... You need to know it enough where you can pull out what people need to know. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Now there's per very important scriptures that we need to know. And like I said, we need to be flavorful. And what I mean, we need to be attractive. People need to be attracted to our spirit. And how we act, how we... How we our character is at work or at school 
wherever we go, there should be something that just attracts. I don't know if any of you have had this experience, but I know sometimes when I've been at work or even at school, even when I was in high school, there was something, because I was not ashamed of Christ, there were times when I didn't even realize people were paying attention, and then out of nowhere they'd say, hey, Joe, can you pray with me? When they were going through something, I was the one they looked for, because they knew there was something different about me and then others. And that's how we should be. There should be something different that stands out. And no matter where you go, there should be something. And where I like to get to a point is not just, not because it's me, but the God who lives in me, Christ who lives in me. There should be something. When we come in a building, people should take notice, not because, like, oh, there's Pastor Justin, but there's a man of God. Not because he's P- Pastor Justin, but because he's a man of God. Because Crystal's a woman of God. There should be something about our character that just people, and honestly, there should be something about us that even when we go somewhere bad, that people are uncomfortable because they're when they're dealing with sin, there should be like, ooh, something is disturbing my soul here because light has just come in, and we're about to talk about that. Because the next verse is, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put light, a lamp, and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on the stand, and he gives light to everyone in the house. And I can't help but read this, but you have to think about the song. And I think you know what song I'm about to sing. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Then we never said bowl. We always said hide under a bushel. That's how we always say it. I don't know. But when you have a light, like I said, if I need to get light, I'm on the course back then, then you kind of lamp, they had lamps, so you would have to light it. It had a little oil on it. You light it. But if you put it over a bowl or a basket or whatever, eventually what? It's going to go out because it doesn't have the air and it's going to smother it, right? And then, of course, later in the song, it says, I'm not going to let who? Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. And even though, and that's the thing. Sometimes I think when I'm at home, some of the songs come to my head are just, we call them children's church songs. But you know what? There's a lot of power in a lot of children's church songs. Just a simple one, B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. I mean, there's a lot of truth in those songs, but I don't know why when we get older we feel like, oh, we can't sing those as kids. But there's a lot of truth and a lot of, a lot of goodness in those. But we are supposed to be the light of the world, meaning everywhere we go, we're supposed to shine bright. And that kind of goes along with what I just said. There should be something about us when we go in a room we should be on our knees daily so because let's be honest pastor talked a little about it about this morning this world is definitely getting darker and darker and darker in this great country we're going to celebrate the fourth of july the independence day and the hope that you know i think it was reagan who not too long ago claimed we were a hill on the shining i mean sorry i said wrong a city on the shining hill he's talking about america because back even back in the 80s, there was still a thing about we were supposed to be an example to others. And that was the point. And they pulled scripture. I think if you really went back, and I'm sure if you want to take a class with pastor, you can fill it all in. But if you went back, there were many presidents. They constantly quoted scripture. And they were proud that we were a Christian nation. But we're no longer there in the sense of the majority don't, like Pastor, we, I mentioned, or I think it was me, one of us mentioned, that, that the biblical worldview, yeah, it was me when I spoke. When I talked, I think, uh, I guess it was last month, I don't remember, when I talked about how even in churches when they did a poll, that only, like, I forget the number now, I think it's crazy, like only 20% or something like that, might have been lower, really had only a true biblical worldview, even in the church. under the age of 40. They don't have a biblical worldview anymore. It's non-existent. This country, 
no matter what they may say in high school or wherever, was founded on Geo-Dale-Christian beliefs. It's all through our Constitution. It's all through the founding. But we are no longer a city on Shining Hill as speak of a country. But as individuals in that church, we still should be that city on the shining hill, or that city on a hill. And as darkness is creeping in, even in the churches, homes, families, extended family, again, even with your friends, there should be something. And again, it's not about you. It's about who lives inside you. There should be something that when you go into their home or whatever, they should feel uncomfortable. Because spiritually, when there's darkness, is going to feel uncomfortable when true light comes in. If you really want to know if you're walking with God, go into a dark place and see if anyone even bothers to, if they feel any different. If you feel any difference, like when you're praying or whatever. Because again, when you're really walking with God, there should be some uncomfortableness when people are in darkness. Because light and dark can't be together. They can't. The example I shared with the boys when I was doing the devotion with them is when it gets real, if you all have been, like, not too long ago, we just had a full moon. But the opposite of full moon is when you can barely see it. and Or even if the clouds are out, it can get very dark in the woods. Have you ever been in the dark when it's like in the woods when it's really, really dark? All right, you trip over everything. You can't see nothing. But it's amazing if you stood there, same spot where you could literally not even see your hand. There are places on this world where you couldn't even see your hand because it gets that dark. And if you stay there long enough and slept in a tent, when you woke up, that same darkness. Once the sunlight hits, it's amazing how you can see everything, even to the little tiniest bug that's crawling around. Because light penetrates darkness and gets rid of it. So in the sense of spiritually speaking, the light of Christ, when it hits somebody, all those dark spots have to leave. And as Christians, we have to be that light. We have to, when people are walking in darkness, and I know it can get uncomfortable, we can't just give them, you know, I, I think sometimes we get, like, oh man, I don't really want to tell them. We're, we're afraid to tell the truth because we're afraid of hurt feelings. We're afraid to. But if you really want to help people, you got to tell them when they're walking in darkness. Because we can't assume that they know better. Because they may not know better. And even if they do know better, we need to continue to shine light because if we're not going to do it, how do we know anyone else is going to? We went to the men's conference. One thing that we talked about a lot is, as the priest of the home, it's my responsibility to cover my house in prayer as the head of the household. I have to cover the house in prayer. I got to pray over my children and pray over my wife and things like that. It's my responsibility. So when there's, and then if, and if for some reason, if there's someone here who has a man and as the husband, but if, of course there are times where the husband is not a Christian. So then, like in my life, it was my mom, because my dad wasn't there at halftime, and then when he was there, he was not living in light. But I can remember hearing my mom's prayers above me, and I was downstairs, she'd be upstairs, I could hear her praying out to God, praying for me, praying for my brother, praying for nephews and nieces and things. We have to be the light when there's no light there. We have to cover the ones that we love Sometimes when they don't even know they need cover. But if we see something wrong, if I see something wrong, it does me no good. If I see my son, now granted my kids are still young, so they haven't gotten to the dating and all that aspect yet. Which I know it's coming. Drew's going to be 14, so he's on the verge of really... He right now, honestly, he's probably just starting to not be icky about girls anymore. I mean... I mean, I think a year ago, I would say something, and he'd be like, eh. Now, he gives me a different response, and I noticed the other day, 
I forget what I said, but the way he responded, like, uh oh. He's starting to notice now. Now, he probably noticed a little earlier than I thought. But the point is, he's starting to get there. But in the sense of my children, if I see them doing something that's wrong, it's my responsibility as a father when they're my son to let them know. Like I told Summer the other day, it's like, you know, I, now I have no suspicion that they are doing anything. But I was like, hey, Summer, you know what? They both have tablets. You need to pick them up and just look at them just in case. Because sometimes they may not even know they're looking for And they're not necessarily wrong in a sense of evil, but they could be looking at something that, you know, because they look at, most times they're looking at how to beat, they have a game, so they look at YouTube videos to help themselves play, but sometimes, as you know, on YouTube, something might pop up. There might, they might be watching, because the other thing, even with Leanna, I noticed, not, not, it was just an innocent site where you just go and you watch a bunch of kids playing toys, I don't know, like people, I don't know if you've ever seen those sites, it's like, other people playing with toys. But she clicked on one, and I noticed that what the person was doing was it kind of was adding some, like, I don't, I don't know what it was. It wasn't, it was like a cartoon that clicked on it. But basically it was like a promoting, like, homosexuality. In a, in like, in a very slide way. So I was like, oh. I was like, man, what are you doing? You know, and again, it was innocent. She just, it just boom, popped up. So I had to that's the point. So that's why th when they watch it, they know they always have to watch it in our presence. So we can't walk up behind them at any moment, see what they're doing, like make sure they're good. But even on Disney Plus, I told Drew the other day, I was like, hey Drew, I noticed even on Disney Plus, which is Disney's app, they have a whole thing, which they never, they didn't have this last year. This year they have Pride Month. And that's, that just didn't really surprise me. But what surprised me is they actually have some cartoons it was Pixar's first one. I don't know what it's called. And then there's another one. And it's just a, no, just a regular cartoon. I think one was the prince wants, or the prince wants to be a princess or something is, is called. And I was like, wow. So I told Drew, I was like, hey, Drew, you need to, because Drew knows what to watch and I want to watch. And I was like, hey, if Anna ever clicks on, make sure she's not watching these, you know, make sure she's watching Dumbo or Bambi or the old school stuff. Because that's the thing. But it's my responsibility as a parent to go back and check on those things. I can't just assume that everything is good, especially in today's world. Because all it takes, uh, as you know, if, if you're going to if you're going to have something, all it takes is one wrong click, whether they mean to or not. But it's also my my responsibility as they get older to let them know if they're doing something that is sinful. If I if my son, no, I don't think he will, but if my son goes out and I find out he's at a party or whatever, I have to be the one that calls him out. I can't just assume, well, he's just being a teenager or whatever. Because I can't allow him to walk in darkness. I can't condone sinful behavior because it's my household. And I, more than anyone, as the father house I'm supposed to be the biggest light in my house because as it says here instead they put it on its stand and gives light to everyone in the house and here literally I'm talking about my household I have to be the biggest light in the household and now if you're someone again all households are different some have single moms some then Whoever the parent is, you have to be that light that lights up the house. You are going to have to light up the rest of the house. Your prayers are going to have to cover everyone else. You are going to have to do double time to get sin and wickedness and darkness out of your house. Now, the prayer is, you know, and that's my prayer, is my prayer is that my children, they're walking with God now, that they continue to walk with God, and they shine their lights too, and then we won't have to worry about that. But for somebody who's listening, who's, who maybe you just became a Christian, maybe your children don't know, you have to be that light. You have to confront the darkness. Because as I said, once you shine light on darkness, it's either going to flee, or in the case of spiritualness, it might try to fight. But don't you know, in the name of Jesus, it can't stand 
but then it will have to flee. It may not just like quickly go away. You might have to sometimes fight through it. Like, no, in Jesus' name, whatever the sin is that's going on, you will not be allowed in my household. And then 16 says this, In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Because, see, again, let our light shine before men, not because, again, not because we're saying, look how great I am, but look how great the one who died for me is. Look at what he's done for me. Look at the things he brought me out of. Look at the things he saved me from, kept me out of. He can do it for me. He can do it for you. And that's why it's important that when you are going through something, because, again, Christianity is not a ticket that life is woo, perfect, nothing happens. That's not Christianity. But what it does give you is when something does come, it gives you that peace and all that. But what we can't do as Christians, because I tell you, one way to click, quickly hide your light is when you're going through something, be like the rest of the world and just start complaining. Oh, life is horrible. Oh, this is miserable. Oh, I can't take it. Because that's all you are being now is a defeated Christian, and who wants what you got? I know that might be harsh, but who wants what some Christian complaining about? Oh, this is so horrible. I, you know, and you just go on a little list, and trust me, Unfortunately, I've known some Christians in my family like that. I've known some Christians in my life like that. And trust me, if even as another Christian, it turns me off. I don't even want to be around them. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Because guess what? Sometimes you start getting into conversation. The next thing you know, you start complaining. I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. So I'm like, I'm going to get out of here. Cause, or you need to start shedding light. Like, hey, brother, hey, sister. But what about the fact that, yes, you got ill, but how about the fact that you're not dead yet? You're alive. You can still see. I mean, you start looking at the bright spots. We, ha As Christians, when things come our way, we still got to always look at the big picture. And that is God is on the throne. He's going to see us through it. And he's going to give us the strength to overcome it. Not to say we won't go through it, but he'll give us the strength to overcome what we're going through. And that's why your, your talk has to be different. So I think one of the number one ways that we turn people off is with our mouths. Because we say we love God and we talk about all this, but, oh, you should go to church with me and we do all this. But then once something happens in our life, we're just as complaining. Hopefully not, but maybe some are cursing just like the other person. Their mouth turns dark. They start getting depressed and out, and then people are like, well, wait a minute. What happened to you? What happened to your light? Well, I just kind of covered it. I kind of put in the negative. And there's nothing more, like in this psalm says, that Satan would not love to do more than blow out your light. Or it's not seen anymore. And another way, Christians, with our mouths, that we not only do we claim something and then don't live it, but then we blast other Christians. Oh, look at that person down the street. Oh, they're not this. They're not that. And then we judge them for for not being as good as me and all that. And trust me, unfortunately, once again, in my family and in my churches that I've been in, I've seen a lot of that too. And one of the number one things I've heard, I've heard this, I don't know about pastors, but I'm talking about legit people who, and again, I'm not giving them an excuse not to come. But probably the number one thing I've heard from young people, older people, any generation, say why they don't go to church. And they say, because of the hypocrites in the church. And they usually start giving me a fairly good example. Now then, I to quickly turn it, that's a good guess, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't go to church just because there's hypocrites, there's hypocrites at work, you know, and I do that whole thing. But the point is, we need to be careful because if we are not walking with God and we do become a hypocrite and we don't practice what we preach whether it's 
whether they should come to church or not, we still don't want to be the one thing that pushes them completely away. When people come to church, they should feel loved, not judged. They should feel welcomed, not rejected. Because that's how God accepts us. When we ask God for forgiveness, He forgives us. He doesn't. Once He forgives us, He He doesn't judge us anymore. I mean, He doesn't. He doesn't judge. He forgets it. You know, He throws it. What do you say? From the east to the west, He forgives everything. So we got to be careful. To when someone does come to Christ, and they are forgiven, we need to forgive them too. They said something bad about us when they weren't a Christian. We got to know, hey, they're a new person now. Can't hold grudges. And like I said this in Sunday school, and remember, Christians aren't really supposed to judge sinners anyway because sinners don't know unless we tell them that they're even doing something wrong. How do we judge people? It's through the fruits of the Spirit. But the only people who are supposed to have fruits of the Spirit are people who claim to be walking with God. If you claim to be walking with God, then I can judge you by the fruits of your spirit. When you say you're claiming you're walking with God, well, I don't see kindness, I don't see joy, I don't see that. But a non-Christian, they don't know about that unless I tell them about that. And that's one of the reason we talked about that is because we were talking about if someone came in dressed like they were on the street, we can't just completely, oh my gosh, you can't be dressed like that, get out. No, we have to, even though we may not want to see them dressed like that, we need to welcome them in so they can come to the altar, repent, and then let God start changing them. But I think the thing that turns away a lot of the world is the fact that Christians, in my opinion, are weak in a lot of things that they say. We claim a lot of things, but then we don't believe them ourselves. We claim healing, but then we complain when we have whatever issue. We claim, we claim, man, God can bring victory to your life, but then I complain about my life to you. So you can't do that. You can't be like, oh, God is great. He's going to do great things for you. And then 10 minutes later, I'm just like, man, life is hard. Man, my life is annoying. Oh, whatever. And I just go on all this list. They're like, Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I just thought you said with God all things are impossible. But you're sitting there saying you can't fix your marriage. You get what I'm saying? You can't say claim you love God and God says nothing is impossible for him, meaning anything. And then I'm like, but man, there's no hope for me and my wife ever fixing this. That's double-minded. Can't be double-minded. And again, I'll finish with this. I know these are things that we've heard many, many times. Especially, well, if you've been in church for a while, you've heard about being the salt and the light. I'm sure I've heard messages on this over and over again. But sometimes I think we forget the simple messages. Like there's things of, hey, I am the salt. I am the light. I got to do better. Because... Again, making it personal, not only am I supposed to be the light of the world, but the people who are, for me, the ones I have to worry about most are my three little children. They're watching everything I do. I may not even know it. They may not even claim it. They may joke. They're not. But I know they are. They're paying attention to every word I say, every word I say to Summer. How I, every, the one thing I got to know is every time I tell Summer, hey, Summer, let's, I'm going to do this, and then I don't do it, I got to realize, wow, Drew and Lucas probably just noticed I told Summer we were going to do this, and then we didn't do it. So I got to be careful, like Pat said earlier, I got to be careful with my yes and no's. I got to make sure my yes is yes and my no is no. They're watching how I act with other people. When I'm around my friends, am I acting goofy and silly? improperly with them or am I being righteous to them meaning friends who may not be Christians they're watching me how everything I say 
everything I do, everywhere I go. And I am their greatest example, other than Christ, is going to be the parent. So for those who are parents, your kids are watching, even when you don't think they are. They're listening, and you don't think they hear. I know that with Leanna. Leanna is funny. We'll be talking about something. We'll just mention her name about in, a, in a story to someone else. And almost every time, out of nowhere, Leanna just shows up. She could be like three rooms away, and she hears her name, she hears the story, and she comes with like, Ooh. she's like, when we're talking to grandparents or whatever. So I know they're listening, even when I don't think they are. Like I said, she literally could be two rooms away, and she hears her name and starts hearing the story, she'll come. So that lets me know, okay? So that means she listening to every conversation. So that also means sometimes, being summer, we are talking about more important things. We have to make sure where we're talking about it. You know, because they are listening. We do got to be careful. And even in the sense of, obviously, you know, even though Summer thinks I would tell you I'm the perfect husband, I'm not. But even when we have disagreements, we have to be careful how we respond to each other because they're watching. Are we throwing things at each other? Oh, yeah. You know? Are we talking respectful to one another? But guess what? Especially my sons. They're going to learn from me. They're going to be like, oh, well, dad cursed at mom, so I guess I can curse at my wife one day. I also have to pay attention, okay, how am I talking to my mom, my own mom? Because how I talk to my mom, Drew might be saying, oh, well, Joe, or Dad talks to his mom like this, or dad or whoever. I guess I can talk to my mom and dad like this. Everything I do, obviously God's watching, but my children are watching. And for those of you, you can say, well, I don't have kids. It doesn't matter. No. They might not be children, but there's someone watching. When you're at work, once you say, once you claim this, God's word, in your life, and people know it, they're watching. I remember when I was high school, again, I was pretty known. I was not shy about that. I went to church and all that. And I, I can tell you right now, I don't know how I did it, but in my entire life, I probably said 11 curse words in my entire life. I can remember every time I said a curse word. Because even as a kid, I was always told not to curse. And I remember even my friends, even some of my church friends, I would use, like, you know, I'd say, darn it, or something, but sometimes... Maybe some of you will notice, especially when I was younger, I'd mumble sometimes. So I might be mumbling, darn it. And they were like, oh, no, you said it. They'd be all wanted. They were waiting for me to really curse. They're like, no, that's not what I said. I said, darn it. So even, so even then, I had to be careful of how I said things because I knew people were listening. Because I might need, I wasn't even, most of the time, I wasn't even in a conversation necessarily. It would be like people behind me, two rows back. Anyway, what, what'd you say? What'd you say, Joe? What'd you say? Like, I didn't say that because they were just waiting for me to mess up. So once you claim God's word, there are going to be people watching and listening to everything you do. And the more you claim it, the more they're going to watch. They're going to watch your behavior, how you react to things. They're going to watch how you react to your boss at work. So he says he's a Christian, but he curses out the boss just as much as I do. Oh, maybe you don't curse. Well, he says he's a Christian, but he's here in the corner talking bad about the boss just as much as I am. So maybe you don't have kids. Trust me, someone's watching you. Other family members. Co-workers. Someone's watching. Montana, college. Other classmates. And then who else is watching you? Is the adversary, the accuser. He's waiting. He's waiting for that area that you just start giving in to the little bit of darkness. He's going to come very quick. He's going to try to tice you in more and more and more. And then when you do give in just to a little bit to the darkness, that's when the accuser may use other accusers to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. The 
because like Pastor was saying earlier, you know who else is listening is those who are anti-Christian. Soon they will be listening more. They'll be hearing what we're saying. What we're preaching, they're really going to care more about what we're preaching against. So they can turn it into, oh, you're haters. You hate people. Oh, you're not loving. Because that's, that's the one way that they're going to really start attacking us. Is we hate this group. We hate this group. And it's like, no, we love this group and this group. That's why we're telling them about Christ. Because we want them to be in eternity with Christ. It's not because we hate them. It's because we love them. But soon they will just, I mean, in other countries, they're listening to Christians too. Why? Because they want to shut it down. And that's another reason why we have to share the light, because we can't be afraid. That's the part of not hiding the light. We can't be, and in this, in this generation of living right now, it's easy for us to want to hide under something, because it's so negative towards Christians out there right now. If you put a positive Christian post out there, there's probably, depending on your your Facebook friends, you're, don't be surprised if you get a negative comments on it. And it's easy sometimes just not to say nothing. Like, you know, I'm just going to have to say nothing. I'm not going to rise up right at this moment. I'm just going to let those people con continue to fight in darkness and not worry about it because I have a family. Like Pastor said, I don't want to lose anything. I don't want to get, you know, caught up in all that. I'm just going to get my own little bubble here. And, well, just, yes, I'm going to, I'm just going to stay right here in this little corner where I'm safe. And I'm just going to watch everyone I love go to hell. Because I don't want to say that because I don't want to be called a, a hateful person. I don't want to be called this homophobic, homophobic person. I don't want to be called this or that. I don't want to be called these things. So what I want to do, and you know what? The, adif the adversary loves that because he knows Christians are doing that left and right now. So you know what he's been doing? Upping the attacks, upping the attacks. And you know what? You'll see more churches cower in a corner, turn off their Facebooks, turn off all their things. They don't want the word to get out. because They're afraid of what people might hear. So what they're doing, they're getting a closer little bubble, and they think they're being a light, but they're not because they just pretty much just covered their light because they're not shining because – who are we supposed to be like to? To each other? In a sense, but most of what? What does it say? In the same way, let your light shine before men, but it says you are the light of the world. So if we just keep closing ourselves in more and more, who's the light of the world then? No one. So we cannot be afraid of what someone may call you. Because I tell you, and we were, me and Pastor were listening to, a, I forget who we were listening to, we were listening to a meeting with all these different pastors, and one of the guys, he said, the one, number one way they're going to attack Christians is call you, say that you hate, you're evil, you're mean-spirited, and people are going to be afraid to be called that, so they're going to just stop saying anything. You can't be afraid, because, hey, look at the things they call Jesus. Jesus was accused of a lot of false things. So much so that they killed him for no reason at all. And not to make you scared, but they're going to kill the most perfect human ever that walked on earth for no reason. And they hang him on the cross, he'll do the same to you. And expect it, the pastor said. we got to expect these things as we get closer and closer. But that's why we need to be in God's Word. That's why we got to preserve His Word in our hearts and our minds. That's why we need to be on our knees praying. That's the importance, especially in the Pentecostal church, that's the importance of having the gift of the Holy Spirit so He can, so you have the power. That is probably the, no, this having Holy, not having the gifts 
keep you from heaven? No, but man, you're losing out on a lot of power to overcome the adversary. You're fighting a battle not fully armed. You're like fighting a battle, you know, only with half, like instead of full round, you're fighting with half a round. But when you have the Holy Spirit, and you have the gifts, and you have the Holy Spirit, and you're filled with that Spirit, then you can attack the devil 100%. That's why it's important if you don't have that, to seek it, continuously to seek it. And then it's also important is if you have the gift, use it. And I know we don't talk about it a lot, but that's why when Paul said, I speak in tongues more than all of you, because he was talking about when he's in his prayer closet, that's why when we are alone, fine, you don't want other people, then at least when you're in your prayer closet, use this gift that God gave you, because guess what? The adversary doesn't know what you're saying to him. You're just giving a, you're giving like a free way to praise God without the adversary being able to do anything. So use the gift. And all the gifts of the Spirit. Don't be timid if God puts a word on your heart. Because I know the devil, probably the number one thing he likes to do is when he puts something on your heart, whether it's a word or something, is, oh man. Is that really God? Is that just me? And you start debating it in your head and you go on. You got to be, you no. Know, if God puts something on your heart, you got to know. And then one of the gifts that we all need in today's world is definitely the gift of discernment. We need to be able to discern the spirits that are around us. We need to discern, okay, is this something, is this just a kid acting up? Is there something bigger behind it? We need to be able to discern that. As a youth pastor, I need to know, okay, am I just dealing with, you know, a typical teenage problem that, you know, all teenagers go through, or is this something bigger? Is there some kind of spirit behind this that I don't know about? I need to discern that. Your conversations with people, you need to be able to discern, okay, I know when I'm talking, when people are talking, you need to be able to discern, okay, this person's hurting. I need to pray for them now. The spirit of sermon, I think, is one that we don't talk enough about, but it's a big, it's a big one. We need to discern what's going on around us. If you don't have that, I pray you use it, and I pray you, I pray that you pray for it. So God gives you that spirit of discernment. Trust me, it's got me in a lot of, a lot of problems. It's got me out of a lot. Of, ooh, I don't want to go now. That's a place I don't need to go right now. Or. There's been times like, okay, I know what I'm about to get into, but I know what I'm about to deal with, so let me pray a little bit before I go in. That way I know before I go in there, okay, I can feel the heaviness. I can feel, okay, God, I know you're about to use me, so let me you know, get in your, and then walk in. But we need to be the light. Because if you're not going to do it, and I don't care if you're four or 84, I don't know the ages of people here. I don't care what your age. I've said this over and over. You're still alive. You're still breathing. You're still kicking. And God's not done with you. You're still a light to somebody. It could be a neighbor. It could be a grandchild. You're still a light. So let it shine. Don't hide it. Don't be fearful of the adversary. Because again... Through Christ. Just remember that was it. Through Christ. And remember that I can do all things through Christ. All things through Christ. But remember, don't forget the through Christ. I can't do all things. No, I can't. But through Christ, I can do all things. And don't be a bitter person. Be a salt to people. Be that flavorful thing that people want to be around and hang around. Be something that is, you know, valuable to be around. Don't be bitter or nasty. People don't want to hang around that. You're no longer salt anymore. You're a discouragement. You're scaring people off. And then most importantly, don't let Satan blow it out. 
Don't give him an edge. When you see darkness, flee from it. Or shine light on it so it flees from you. Because once, like I said, once you get just a little bit of darkness, the enemy's coming with more and more. And unfortunately, we know many even in this area who once walked in the light and no longer are right now. Because either they let the enemy snuff it or they're hiding it or they're hiding themselves. And then here's the thing, once you hide yourself, you know, Pastor preached this a lot last year, do not forsake the fellowship of others. Why? Because when I hide my light to myself, even among other Christians, I'm just a bigger target for the enemy because I'm by myself. I don't have my prayer warriors around me. I don't have the people I can, you know, yeah, I can jump on Facebook. Trust me. You know what? It's nice it's sometimes to have Facebook and say, you know, say a prayer. But, you know, I don't care. There's nothing better than coming here and having you all lay your hands on me and pray. There is just something different. Now, I appreciate it when I can't get here, if it's the middle of the week or something, you know, to ask people to pray. But there is something about having other believers, especially spirit-filled believers, lay their hands on you and just the, what you feel. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. But when you're alone, yeah, you can say, yeah, I think, because here's the thing. You can say, please pray for me, and people can say, oh, yeah, you know, they the prayer symbol and all that. But do you really know they're really praying for you? No. I mean, you kind of trust that they are, but you don't know. Because I'm not would I lie to you to say that I saw a prayer request and said, yeah, I'll pray for you, but I was, like, in the middle of running or doing something with my kids. Oh, there's a quick, okay, yeah, pray. And then am I going to ever lie to say I didn't remember? I can't say that I haven't never not remembered not to pray. If I was, like, in the middle of something, and I will get back to it. For example, yesterday at the men's thing, I met two brothers. One was going through something. His, he shared with me, and he was sharing me how his, his wife had a miscarriage, and things were hard, and they were working with God, and now they weren't because, you know, what happened. Well, at first I said, okay, I'll be praying for you. And then I walked away. But then something hit me, because I always tell my youth, don't wait, pray then. So I made sure I walked. Before I left, I found the gentleman again. And I prayed over him there. Because even though my intentions are, yeah, I'll pray with you later. There's a difference. Again, there is something different when someone says, I'll pray for you, than when they just lay their hand on you and pray for you there. And then another gentleman, I can't remember his name, but he's from India, and he's going to the faith bible college and he's going to be an evangelist that's what he told me and he's excited he loves being here in maine and he's going to college he's a junior so i before he i left i just felt i was like you know what because I, I told him when i first met him you know because at the time there was a bunch of people talking i was like yeah man i'll be praying for your ministry the same thing I was like, you know what? i need to do it now so he knows i'm going to do it so i tracked him down before right before we ate the brisket and i put my hand on him and i prayed now, did I say that because I'm trying to tell you all the great deeds I did? No. I'm trying to tell you that is there is different, and I could tell the difference of them when I first just told them, hey, I'm going to pray for you. They were, oh, okay, thank you. But there was a different reaction when I actually laid my hand and I sat there and prayed. The reaction when I was done told me everything I needed to know. And that's why, and I even told the first guy, I was like, well, I had to come back and track you down because I couldn't be a hypocrite. I told all, I always tell my youth to pray then, not to wait so let me pray for you in Walmart when you run into somebody there's been a couple times where I prayed for people right there but you know what because you know what again I'm human I can say I'm going to pray for you but then what happens I get home three kids running up to me they want this Summer's like hey I, did you do this for me oh yeah I forgot to do the trash or whatever it is Or so by the time I get it and I forget okay how many's ever forgot something Okay? So do it there. Sorry, I just lost subject a little bit. But let's pray for one another. And don't be afraid to ask for prayer. That's another thing. I know it's a different subject, but that's another thing. I don't know why we as Christians... Well, I don't want people to think... And, you know, we allow the enemy to tell us, well, if I, ask, I have to ask for prayer, then they think there's something wrong. Or, you know, you go, you get all these images, like, 
maybe I'm the youth pastor if you're the pastor. Well, I'm the pastor. I don't want people to pray. Or whoever. You're like, well, I don't want. Or maybe it's because, man, but I've asked people to pray for me too much. Who cares? If you need prayer, need prayer. I don't care if you come over 35 times. I'd rather you come every single time we have altar call and have someone to pray or every single night have someone lay hands on you. I'd rather you do that than you never come ask for prayer forever. Because if you need prayer 35 times, me and Pastor and everyone here would gladly pray for you 35 times. It's the ones who won't ask for prayer that I worry about. Because all you're doing when you don't ask for prayer, when you're dealing with something, you're just trying to fight it yourself. You're holding it in. And it doesn't have to be a sin or nothing. But it could just be whatever you're struggling with. Why struggle alone? Don't let the adversary fool you. Like, oh, but if you tell people what you're dealing with, they're going to think bad. At you. No. And if there is one, then shame on that person. That's not how we're supposed to be here. We're not supposed to, again, like I said earlier, we're not supposed to judge people when they come up for prayer. We're supposed to pray for them and be glad, wow, they feel comfortable enough in a place where they believe that we can help them. So let's pray for them. Now later, depending on what it is, pastor might say maybe we need to talk about it. That's different, but that's just to get help. So don't let the adversary fool you. And scare you away from a blessing. Because I think there's a lot of times, including myself, I'm sure I probably walked away from a blessing because of whatever reason I decided not to have someone pray for me in my... 43 year, young years. And I'm sure everyone here has probably done that too. Where you knew you needed prayer, you needed to go to the altar. And it might, again, it might not be something big, Mr. It could be just something small, but even that, but what happens? That little thing turns into another little thing, and then you're carrying 20 little things, but it feels like some giant thing. It doesn't always have to be some big issue in your life that keeps you from things. It could just be 20 little teeny issues that you feel like you can do on your own. You're not Superman. No one is. We need one another. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you, Lord. I know it's a hot night here, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for everyone that came out. Lord, Lord I just pray that you, Lord, speaking to myself, Lord, that you'll help me be salt and light to this earth, Lord. Lord, this world and this country, Lord, this state, this river valley, this town, Rumford, and even members in this church, Lord, need more people to be salt and light. So, Lord, help me to be flavorful, Lord. Help me to show something good inside me that they will want and not want to reject. Lord, I pray, Lord, that my light will penetrate darkness, Lord, through you. Lord, I pray, Lord, that this church and members of this church, Lord, we will start, that we won't, we'll stop hiding our light, Lord, but shining it brighter, Lord. Lord, that we won't walk towards darkness, Lord, but we will shine our light on it so it will flee. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you'll just help us all, Lord, to be light of the world, light of Rufford, Lord. Lord, I pray for this country, Lord. I do believe at one time, Lord, we were, even in a Christian sense, we were the city on the hill, Lord. We were. We were the, we were the country at one time was sending missionaries out left and right, Lord. Lord, but now, as I hear more and more, more and more other countries are sending missionaries to us because of where we fall. So, Lord, as Independence Day is coming, Lord, I pray for this nation. I pray, Lord, that more Christians in this nation, Lord, will start standing up, Lord, and being light to this country. And letting them know, Lord, that there's only one true peace, and it's found through your Son, Christ. Lord, that all those other things that they're dabbling in, whether it's alcohol or drugs or pornography or whatever it is, Lord, that they try to cope, use to cope, Lord, that, Lord, that's not going to satisfy them, but there's one who will satisfy them. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he will give them the coping and the, the peace that they are looking for. And the freedom they're looking for. Lord, as we were talking about Independence Day, Lord, freedom, Lord, true freedom comes through you, Lord. And Lord, I know there's lots of people, Lord, probably watching, and maybe some here, Lord, who are 
need some kind of freedom, Lord, whether it's stress, Lord, whether it's a physical pain that they need freedom from. Lord, I pray, Lord, that your power, Lord, your Holy Spirit will start moving, Lord. Your healing power will start moving, Lord. Right now, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that your healing power will start healing people's bodies, Lord, their souls, their minds. And Lord, let us find the ultimate rest in you. Lord, I pray that our families, Lord, as we went to this men thing, Lord, in this town, Lord, I think it's almost 70% are single moms. Lord, I pray, first of all, for those 30% where the men are still, Lord, that they'll start being God-fearing men, Lord, and they'll start leading their homes. But, Lord, I pray for the church and the men of this church, Lord, that we have many kids who come here without fathers, Lord, who don't even know who their father is, Lord. Lord, I pray, or they just have a horrible relationship, Lord, that us as men, Lord, that we will start standing in the gap because that father's not here, Lord. Through our prayers, Lord, even that we just get with them and pray with them, Lord, and just ask them occasionally how they're doing, ask them about their schoolwork, Lord. Lord, I want them to feel loved. And even though their earthly father left them, that they'll learn through us that their heavenly father never will. He will never leave or forsake them. Lord, I pray for the families that are represented in here, Lord. Lord, I pray for children and grandchildren, Lord, that are represented, Lord. Lord, I pray, Lord, for revivals to start happening, Lord, in homes, Lord. Lord, revival is not just for churches, Lord. Revival can happen anywhere. Lord, in my home, Lord, I pray, Lord, that there's a revival and my children will grow deeper and deeper in you, Lord. Lord, I, it's awesome that Drew and Lucas were baptized, but, Lord, I want them to have a bigger experience than that, Lord. I want them to really know, Lord, I want my sons and my daughters to be filled with your Holy Spirit, with the power of the tongues as evidence. Lord. Lord, I pray that for my children. Lord, I pray that for anyone here who has never received the Holy Spirit, the baptizer, Lord. Lord, that you will fill them with your Holy Spirit. As Pastor just talked about Pentecost, Lord, Lord it's not just for them. It was for us too, Lord. Lord, I pray for anyone who's watching, Lord, who may not know you. Lord, I pray, Lord, that they will know that there is one who can take away all that pain, all that strife that they're going through. That freedom they're looking for is in the one named Christ. So, Lord, I just pray, Lord, if they would just put a message, Lord, and just say, I want to know Christ, that someone will pray with them. Lord, I pray for those who are watching and here, Lord, who just want to be a better light, Lord, that you will just help us, Lord. That you will give us wisdom. And Lord, as I talked about too, Lord, we are also the we are also the ones, Lord, that preserve your word, Lord. So Lord, I pray, Lord, that all of us will grow hungry even more, Lord, to know your word, Lord, to get in our heart. Because Lord, I would not be surprised in my lifetime. That it'll be very hard to find the Word of God around. Especially in my children's lifetime, Lord. I just feel, Lord, that this Word is going to be taken away. But, Lord, they can't truly take it away if it's in our hearts and in our minds, Lord. So I pray my children, Lord, will just, the children of this church will just dive into your Word, Lord, and know it and put it in their hearts, Lord. So even if their physical Bible is taken away, they still know what it says. And they can still teach others. Lord, I just thank you. You're an awesome God. I thank you again. Pastor already said this. But thank you, Lord, for the men who went yesterday, Lord. I pray, Lord, that something that someone said there will penetrate their hearts, Lord, and that it will just grow in them, Lord, and they will try to be better men. I pray for the men that didn't go, Lord. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that this is a church that is not like most, Lord. It is awesome the amount of men that come to this church, Lord. 
It is more than average. But Lord, I want it to be even more. Lord, so I pray, Lord, that the men of this community will start coming in droves. Lord. Lord, I pray for the women, Lord, of this church. Lord, I pray we have some single moms of this church, Lord, some single grandparents of this church, Lord, raising children. Lord, I pray you'll give them peace. Lord, but I also pray, Lord, you'll give them strength as they try to raise their grandchildren and their children in a fatherless home, Lord. And Lord, there may be someone where there's somewhere out there where there's a father raising his children and the mother's gone, Lord. Lord, I pray that you'll give them peace and strength, Lord. Lord, there's so many different family dynamics, Lord, represented in here. But Lord, you love the family, Lord. And the enemy hates the family. So Lord, I lift up our families our grandchildren of the church, nieces and nephews, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that the PAG families, Lord, that there's revival start happening, Lord, that breakthroughs start happening, Lord, that, Lord, that this church is filled with our loved ones, Lord, who don't know you. Lord, I love you. I praise you. Lord, I just pray that you'll just be with our youth in particular, Lord, that you'll just help them, Lord, to shine their light, and the young adults, Lord. Because, Lord, they have, I've said it before, they have it a lot harder than I did, Lord, because of one simple technology tool. There's so much darkness that can come from that phone. Yes, there's some light, but, Lord, there's the access to darkness is so easy today, Lord. When I was young, sometimes we had to go look for it a lot harder. But now it's at a finger tip away, Lord. All kinds of darkness and sins, Lord. So, Lord, I pray for our children, Lord. I pray for our parents, Lord, who are raising them. Lord, I pray for our youth. That they will just come under your authority, Lord. I pray for the darkness in their lives, Lord. Some they brought on themselves, some that other family members have brought in their lives. But Lord, I pray as a youth pastor, Lord, and I pray for this church that we'll be the light that will shine. And there's something about our testimonies, Lord, that they'll start wanting to be drawn more and more to you. Lord, I pray for our children. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that there's five children going to youth camp next week. Lord, I pray that your spirit was there at the camp, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with the speakers at the camp, the worship at the camp. And I pray that all five come back on fire for you, Lord. I pray they have an encounter with you. I pray for the youth camp. We only have two gone. But, Lord, I pray for the two that are going, that they will have an experience like no other. That when they see other youth praising God, that they just get infected through it and they're like wow I want that same thing Lord I just pray Lord I pray for our youth as we go to natural national conference Lord that you'll be with us safely but Lord that you will move in those services Lord and that when they see thousands upon thousands of youth raising their hand that they will see wow I'm not the only one who loves you that there's many others that they're not alone Lord, I pray for movement, that you will move. Lord, I just thank you. You're an awesome God. And Lord, I, again, I just pray, Lord, that we will always shine our lights for you. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen.
that is our prayer, to let our light shine for you and to be salt and light to this world for such a time as this. Bless us now, Lord, with traveling mercies as we head home. Lord God, watch over us, protect us. Bring us back into your house soon, Lord God, that where we can worship together, we can study your word together, we can fellowship together. But Lord, as we prepare to go out to work and regular routine tomorrow, Lord God, and this week, the last part of June, the first part of July, Lord God, I pray we will let our light shine for you. And as we continue to draw closer to one another in times of fellowship, testimony, worship, prayer, and devotion like this here tonight, more importantly, I pray, Lord, that we will continue to draw closer to you, for your word declares in James 4, 8, if we draw nigh or near unto you, you will draw near unto us. In Jesus' name.